Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome back to some of you who have been with us earlier today. Welcome back to the Sync Up Conference. This is the 10th annual Sync Up Conference. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Happy birthday to us. Uh, as you know, the Sync Up Conference is an economic development program of the New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Foundation, which is the nonprofit that owns the Jazz Fest and uses the profits from Jazz Fest for community development programs that we do all year long in the areas of education, economic development, and cultural enrichment. And so our next panel today is what we like to refer to as a case study because we like to um, ask an artist to come and talk to us about the specifics of how they got to a certain level of success. And for today's panel, we have the world-renowned revivalists who are here. <laughs> so everybody, thank you. So please welcome David Shaw, Zach Feinberg, Andrew Campanelli, and the band's longtime road manager, tour manager, David Mellorine. So guys, thank you for being here. I appreciate it. It's great to have you. It's Thanks great to see you. Um, so the band, the, I, I, I've watched a bunch of your interviews online, and I don't want to retread a bunch of ground that you've covered a million times. There's a very famous story that's been told a thousand times about how I want to say it was Zach that was riding his bike back from class at Loyola and comes across David who's singing and playing on his front porch and hears this amazing sound. and like, dude, we got to start a band. And, and I know this guy named Andrew plays drums and three days later they have their first gig and the rest is history, right? Pretty much. We're not going to tell that close. story again. It's pretty close. Some details not exactly correct. But no, yeah. of course not. Well, we're... Uh, <laughs> We take a poetic license here at Sync right. Up. Um, the band started in 2007. Yes. So it's still post Katrina New Orleans. Um, and you guys have been around for a long time. Don't play New Orleans very often. Play it a fair bit. You keep up a presence here, but mostly we know of your comings and goings because we see you guys listed on major festivals all around. And I guess. For me, is one of the things that really caught my attention was over the course of the past year, I have seen these festival flyers, posters that would come across my Facebook feed. And before, like two or three years ago, it would be, you know, those things like Revival is the tiny little at the bottom of the thing. And then all of a sudden you're like in the middle or on the top, like, and there's a list of 50 bands and you guys are no longer on the bottom. You're sort of like, like, oh, and these are big festivals. These are major things that are out there. So obviously there has something that has really increased in terms of your visibility, your profile, your fan base, your attractiveness to festival buyers. So I just want to ask you, do, do you feel, did you feel as if something shifted? Was there a turning point in the the, the career progression of the band? I mean, I could, I could speak to a couple things. I'm sure the other guys could speak to a few, but I would probably say that um, things really, really kind of started to take a, a turn for the better when we switched up our management. I was going to ask you Honestly, about that. Was it, it, was it a change it in working? Because C3, is, yeah, which is a yeah, major concert pr promotion company, they took yeah. over your management. And you also have... Um, uh, what is the name of the booking company? I'm sorry. Madison House. Madison House. Yeah. Thank Phil, you. Phil at Madison House, we, we got with in 2012. We switched over to C3 in February 16, so just about a year ago. So do you yeah. really attribute your more, let's say, your more recent success to that change? I would say yes. that it's, uh, it's kind of a combination and also a culmination of kind of all the work that we had been doing up until that point. You know, it was kind of like the perfect storm, I guess, you know, because we, you know, we had the song. We had the new management, so you now you got the muscle. We had the longtime booking agent that was, you know, really in our corner fighting tooth and nail for, you know, to get us that spot, to get us that billing. Um, so yeah, it was kind of a perfect storm that I'd been brewing for a while, and then, boom. Andrew. Yeah, we need. So we've we've been touring. We started out by touring, right? We just we would go out, bring our own PA, play venues that were not venues and you know and set up our own pa and just and that's how we started so it's we've been going out there 
earning fans one literally one at a time and I mean it, like one person yeah at like bar one person at a time yeah in the early yeah. days it was sometimes yeah it sometimes was, yeah there yeah there's a few shows where when you come back they're yeah. wearing your t-shirt and then yeah exactly that's right and and, they and they've friends. brought a few friends and so that we did that for a number of years and then we we got better at being in the studio you know over the course of a few records so like say we had a song that did the same thing right off the bat we wouldn't have been in a position we didn't have the management to take advantage of it we we didn't have the the experience playing shows and just being you know together for that long to understand to really take advantage of it so you know we've been we've been touring around the country with our old management and with their first management before that. And, you, you know, those things were growing, but as w this sort of the, the song, the S Wish I Knew You was being pushed to radio, we've, we've also had this shift in management and kind of a new energy and perspective that was able to help us take advantage of that in a way. But also it was a, it was a matter of these fans that we had also built spreading and it becoming like an exponential thing where it used to be one person and the next time it was 10, all of a sudden it was like we'd play a place there's 100 people, the next time there's 1,000. We yeah, should also would. give a little bit of credit to the previous managers and, and just state what they have done because they were all extremely valuable to us. Our previous management before C3 was responsible for initially getting us on the festival scene. So in, in about 2013, we had a huge summer. We did like 14 fairly major festivals that summer. We were, we were the, the very bottom of the lineup, but they got a, our foot in that door. Um, kind of crucial. Yeah. I mean, from what I, when I came in, they were already selling shows out. So it wasn't like it's a, a thing that came overnight. That fan base of cultivating one fan, ten, two fans at a time had already spawned and selling a thousand tickets before this Wish I Knew You was ever written. And Dave, when did you join the team? 2014. 2014. Yeah, yeah I think okay. it was Dave's birthday. Ju yeah, Ju my June 2014. Yeah. Dave was like, for my what birthday, I want another Dave. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Give me another Dave. <laughs> I mean, a lot of the a lot of that fan base was just right. We're ready for "Wish I Knew You." They were they're more excited about us, our success, I think, than they are. I mean, than we are. We were surprised and indefinitely by the amount of support that we've had. Just this grassroots build of people, word of mouth spreading, telling everybody exactly how great this live show is, how fun this band is, how humble these guys are, and it's it's been indie, but not in the same way of like blogs and trying to get in the meat just the major avenues of where you're pushing music. We're doing it just conventionally of going out, selling tickets, meeting people. Open. We've never really opened up for major bands. It's not really something we do because we've always been about giving our fans the show that they need versus have to you know, dull anything down or just like play a shorter set than we normally would want to play. It's always about giving the people out in the I'm audience. Spe I'm going to exactly speak to that in a sec. Because so. that's a big thing. Also, for, for those of y'all who don't know, Wish I Knew You is a song that we have right now that's doing really well on radio. Um, it's the second single off our album that came out in the summer 2015, and uh, it's still doing, doing really well. It went to number one on um, a format called a Adult Alternative. Um, it's, it went to number two. It's like currently, I think, number two on Regular Alternative, which is a bigger radio format, and we're currently crossing it over to Hot AC, which is like essentially a pop format. Um, and it's just crushing. So there's a whole there's a whole new influx of of, of fans that, that are that are coming to our shows based off this radio song. However, we already have this diehard community of uh, of fans that just love all of our songs. They like "Wish I Knew You," but you know they're not they're not there for "Wish I Knew You." They're they're there yeah. for the for the for the whole catalog and for the live show experience. That's actually pretty good too, yeah. Scott. Yeah. Um, <laughs> they. Wind Up Records actually put it out, which is now folded, um, and now has been uh, gone. Where the record is now under, out under Razor and Tie, Washington in, Square. Oh, sorry, Washington so Square. W uh, Wind Up was acquired by Concord. Um, Wind Up, they 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 finished it, and now they put us on Washington Square, which is a subsidiary of Razor and Tie, which is a part of Concord. Com companies buy other companies, yeah. Yeah. but we yeah. still which get actually. Them. We play Which shows. In, in my opinion, leads a lot to the success of what we have had with Wish I Knew You. We've gotten two or, and three companies to take a shot at pushing this through radio. 
and it's it's through that collaborative of getting a new radio team, having C3's radio team push it up the ladder. We've had we've we've had enough people's full force, full energy trying to push this forward, as opposed to a you know a song that should have maybe might have fizzled out a year ago if we would have been on the same label. Well, I was just going to say that, I mean, you said the record came out in 2015. We are now practically summer of 2017. Yeah, it's two, two years year album cycle, into yeah. an album cycle. One that, single. That, I mean, that, that's yeah, that's insane. I've heard of. It's also significant to, to, to mention that, like, we, because we had Concord, because we had Concord, um, their radio team working with Wind Up, and then it stayed, you know, a lot of the same people, that we're familiar with, and they have a great radio team, and so you know, having C, bringing C3 in to sort of with their radio team to collaborate with the Concord team, it didn't really change over very much when we went from Wind Up to Washington Square. It was still a lot of the same people. Can I uh, give a little shout out? I, th I think which is a nice uh, illustration of our of our the story of our. Um, where we are today. We have uh, Sherwood Collins right there uh, in the audience. And uh, yeah. Sherwood's a, a New Orleans native. Uh, he was uh, the host of the New Orleans radio show on WWOZ for several years. And uh, in 2008, I was a senior at Tulane. And um, we, were, we just had an album come out. We're, we're playing shows here and there. I emailed every single... Uh, or MySpace message to every single DJ at OZ. And Sherwood was the only one that responded. And, and uh, he said, yeah, come on, come on in. He was the first person ever to play us on the radio anywhere. Worldwide exclusive. Yeah. Right yeah. there, yeah. Sherwood Collins. Um, we came in, we played a song on there, just like acoustic guitar, and, and he was like, awesome. And We, we did know. Concrete, right? Yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. So, all right, so Dave, you wanted to address the, the subject that Dave was, was bringing up about touring your own Shows yeah. are supposed to open it, but let me just ask you it, sure. the question kind of this way. There is a cliche in uh, indie band development, which is that they hit the road and did relentless touring. That's, what, that's the cliche. It's relentless, relentless touring. It's always relentless. It's never... It's not always relentless. It's, you can't relent. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I, I imagine that that's part of what you're talking about. Um, we, well, I was actually going to just kind of speak to... Um, I mean, I will say that we definitely, uh, for the first four years of our touring, it was, it was pretty relentless. <laughs> it's pretty relentless. Um, very I mean, it's it, it, didn't, it, didn't, it didn't seem to end. It didn't seem to end. It seemed like um, we would be out on the road for five weeks, and then we'd come home for a week, and then we'd be back out for another five weeks, and then we'd come home for a little bit, and then it. So it was. It was just this constant. But were you gone, making any money gone, gone at on. that stage? A little bit, you know, a little well, bit. That band. was the dream, though, to be able exactly. to when, that, to be able to tour. So, so like when you do that, it's like the, the dream is coming true. Yeah. When exactly. you come home initially, you're like, oh no, I got to go back to my job or school, and you're like, ah, oh, I want to live Ugh. in that world where it's professional music, and I'm with my friends, and I'm playing a show. Even if I'm not making any money. But the it's ba like yeah, the know. band would make money yeah. enough money that like we didn't have to take out of our pockets but like for the first three years nobody in the band took any money from the band yeah. um yeah at all so how did you eat i uh, had a, i worked it we I all had, had nice yeah, jobs had, that let us leave and come back mark samuels uh, let me let me work at basic so day street, street day while i was working touring. a straight job is, is, is i worked a construction job and I, uh, fortunately i had a, an amazing boss um who he would just, uh, he'd be like, you know, he, we, I had a conversation with him, and he was just like, you know, Dave, I believe in you, man. He's like, I watched the videos on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, he was so, he's like, he's like, you know what? Yeah, he's like, do your thing. You'll all, always have a place That's here. That's very cool. But, but to, get, to get back to the point, so it was about, you know, not going out on the road opening for somebody else, but, but yeah. you know, even if you're playing to the bartender, Doing your we, own, we would your take own the end. opening gig We've if it done, was good. Yeah. You know? We've done that, but I think that one of the things that can happen to a band is as you get bigger and bigger and bigger, you know, you start taking a lot of these like bigger opening slots, and then you it's almost like you're kind of, um, I don't know, it's like you kind of get pigeonholed into that, and it's not necessarily 
something where you're really building your own brand. You're kind of just building something for, you know, someone else, which is, which is cool if, if you're into that. You know, I think it's good to take those opening slots at the right time, but too many of them is, is in, in, my, in my eyes, could, be a, could, be a, could have an adverse effect. A few years ago here at the world famous Sync Up conference, we had a, a major booking agent, a guy named Frank Riley from High Road Touring, who did a keynote for us. And he uh, represents Robert Plant, who was playing at the Jazz Fest that day. And I asked him a question that we hear often in talking about band development, which is that instead of playing for 100 bucks at a club, go get an early slot at the festivals because you can make a couple grand. You it's know? not an either or. I mean, you do both. For fe well, festivals are not like, uh, I don't consider that like an opening, say an opening gig. No, but his, his point was, well, I guess from the band perspective, my question wasn't, uh, isn't it much more to the band's advantage to take the $2,000 early, you know, 11.30 a.m. lanyap stage type slot at, you know, Coachella, yeah. or if you can get there, I mean, or no question, yeah, or yeah. wherever, but as opposed to doing a hundred dollar club show. And his answer was, and I'd love to get your perspective on this. He said, "Well, yeah, that may be great, but what if you know? I pity the poor band that's that's on the opposite stage when Robert Plant is on stage because Robert Plant's going to have fifty thousand people, and these guys are going to have twelve. Right, but both. that's I mean. but Robert Plant's also only going to be going up against some other headliner that day, like the 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 little band that's. The thing about festivals that's so good that was so good for us to get on as the last name on the lineup is like like you said, like we go away, we come back. A lot of people are aware of what we've been doing because they've seen the little name at the end of the lineup. Like there's enough marketing in being on that poster that like if you go and you're the first band of the day and a hundred people see you, like say say you were a band that played Bonnaroo, right? Like f then you. you people would know that you played Bonnaroo, and then even if they didn't go to Bonnaroo, there's some level of, like, you've reached that certain yeah, point your, in their mind. Your fans that saw you in that club celebrate the fact that you're playing that festival. So, like, when we got Bonnaroo in 2013 and we're this baby band, we post on our socials, Bonnaroo! And, like, it's a huge response. And your, and your, your fan, and it's the, you, you narrate the story of your rise and you get more people to believe in it and to believe in you and to believe that you're on this upward trajectory. And it's, that's just that the whole thing, yeah. I also kind of think you have to say no to some of these things at one point. Like I think of getting pigeonholed in the sense of getting stuck at Lanyap at one o'clock every, every day of your career. Like it's great if, you, if that's what you want to do, but if you're looking to grow into, you know, get into a Gentile or an Acura stage or into that's the blues you gotta set, do both. You, gotta, you, you at one point got to foster your own fans. You can't cultivate those people that you expected to be in the paddock just to come and buy your CD and see you at the club show the next time over. Well, and I think the reason that you guys have risen on the bill on the big festivals is because you have now gotten the track record where you can sell the hard tickets, you can go into the yeah. venues. So what is the average size venue that you're playing under your own name and doing pretty well close to sell out? Um, we sold 3,600 tickets in uh, Port Chester, New York last month. I'd say um, average is yeah, about 1,500. So about 1,200 to, to 1,800. Yeah. Yeah. Man, you, go in, you, t you tell any promoter in the country that, that you're night. worth 1,800 tickets at, I don't know, what, 20 bucks a pop? A little yeah, more, probably 20, 30. 20, 25. Yeah. Yeah. That's, so now you're a hard ticket act. You're not an opening band. You're not an 11.30 a.m. lineup stage band yeah. anymore. I think that also gets to sort of what you were saying at the beginning, which is the, one of the first things you said was, you know, band from New Orleans, but we don't, you, know, you don't see us playing in New Orleans all that much. When we first started out, that was, um, it was like, you got to go, you got to play where you can play as much as you can play. And so for the first, say, year or two, we tried to take, we took as many opportunities as we could. And, you know, some bands were getting weekly gigs and some bands were getting, you know, were, were just shedding and, and playing shows, getting used to playing shows. But we started to kind of like, like I said, pack up the PA and go to a club and set it up and take money at the door, you know. And so... The goal behind that was to not was to make our shows events. So like we could play Tipitina's 
once every three months instead of playing like... I think this is an important point. Um, you don't want to devalue your show. If, if you're trying to sell a lot of tickets, you don't want to make yourself available every week because then people can always say, oh, I'll just catch it next week. And, but if your goal is to be, to be a local uh, musician that has a regular gig, that's great. Go for it. But if you're really trying to build it up, don't keep doing the weekly residency. Um, I wanted to Frenchman actually, Street bends beware. Yeah, well, you know. I'm, if you're that one thing, one I think would say caveat to that would be if you're like, say, there's there's a certain thing in New Orleans that people come here for, like yeah. Rebirth yeah. on a Tuesday night. Totally great. Yeah. Every yeah. Tuesday, nothing devalues them because they can. It's people coming here from all over the world to see that. So like it's almost better than going out. Depends on what out, you are and what the goal. The band yeah. formed in New Orleans. Not all of you are from New Orleans. Yeah. None of us are from originally. Okay. Yeah. Um, we're gonna come back to that point in a second. But the band formed essentially in the wake of Hurricane Katrina. Yeah. So how you and your career rise has kind of coincided with the redevelopment of New Orleans in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. Not necessarily to draw this crazy comparison between the rebuilding of the revivalist career and the rebuilding of the city of New Orleans. Yeah. But I, I, you, we do often ask about, uh, for bands coming out of New Orleans, whether being attached to New Orleans as a brand is, is, is helpful on the circuit, even though I think we could all agree that you're not a stereotypical New Orleans sounding band. You're more of a soul rock, indie rock, with a soul vibe yeah. rather than right. a traditional like second line funk kind yeah. of band. So you're not a quote unquote New Orleans band, but you are from here. Um, so I'm assuming that there was a little bit of assistance, you know, some of the New Orleans quite a bit of notoriety. That. But yeah. also I do wonder whether uh, there were difficulties logistically in being based in New Orleans when the city was still very much recovering from the hurricane. I mean, you know, was it harder to be get, getting in and out of town? Actually, I would say no. We kind of, we started in 07, so it was a good two years after that. So it, it was kind of an ideal time. There was, there was new clubs popping up in the city. Um, we didn't really have any logistical um, issues because of like hurricane damage. But did you or benefit from the, the, the renown of the yes, city? Yes, we oh, did. I we yeah, benefited so, yeah. for sure. I Absolutely. Mean. We we would yeah, and we we, we rode that line of being a New Orleans band, not getting pigeonholed as New Orleans music. We just used whatever we could to our advantage. I think everybody. I, I, it seemed like I don't mean to sound like we benefited right. in like, but and it, it, it yeah it it we didn't try and we were pretty clear the whole time that we were not like people who had families and long histories here. We were saying that we were not from here, but we moved here and we loved the city because we loved the music. That's what the, we made, the mu kind of music we listened to and would pursue. But like, you know, I think after the storm, obviously there was a large spotlight on New Orleans. People, w w regardless of our intent, were looking at New Orleans and saying, this is, there's a special music, there's a special culture here that, you know, needs to be looked at more. And so I think, it you know. It was valued more after, it, right after Katrina, New, or New Orleans music was sympathized with and, and, and valued because it, it was this experience of, 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 of loss, of almost losing it. So and there was more attention on it, obviously. But we also really got, we really also benefited from like that, that spotlight being on bands like Rebirth, we did more shows opening for Rebirth than we'll probably ever do with another band. Like in the first few years, they would, if ever, it was like, we've never played Atlanta. You want to go play? We would open for Rebirth and they would put us in front of 500 people or whatever. That's what taught and, us how to do a live show. Too. I'll tell you Sorry. that much. That's how we learned how to, to get a crowd going. Yeah, Rebirth. It's opening for Rebirth and then watching them. That's some do schooling it. right there. Big yep. time schooling. Now, I do have one, one question. Um, when you first started the band, did you have a concept of what style of music you wanted to play? To say, I want to do this. No, it we was still don't. It was, a, this is the music I'll I just play. tell you. So that that kind of a thing has always been. We're you know we're a band full of songwriters, so it's always been like you know a song will be brought to the band. 
or we'll come up with the song, you know, in a jam or, or whatever. And it's always like, okay, well, what arena, you know, first off, let's just see how this song just feels naturally, acoustic guitar, how, however it is. You know, just kind of let the song be the song. Like, I mean, if you, you, a lot of you might have our albums, you know, we can range from some folky country stuff to some just, you know, flat, flat out, you know. Rage kind of stuff, yeah. So, you know, we're always just really, we never really cared about, you know, the style. It was always just kind of like, let's let the song be the song. If I'm singing it, it's gonna sound like us. If Zach's playing guitar, it's gonna sound like us. If, if Andrew's playing drums, it's gonna sound like us. So, that was. Now, some of you, if not all of you, or maybe only one of you, I'm not sure, correct me on this, actually went to music business school in college a few of us uh, a few of us did i'm the only person uh sitting here that did but uh mike also did wherever he is and george and uh, right there. other loyal uh, uh we who is it who else went me mike and george that's it yep. yeah me mike and george so this begs the question did real life turn out to be like what school said it was going to be like did that uh, adequately prepare you for school, a career as a touring musician school uh, sort of made me think that uh, well, school it gave me a lot of things. Uh, it gave me the the general understanding for how the industry works, which I think is easy to overlook once you understand it. Because like from the outside, you're not born with the kind of weird information that this business is you know made of. So publishing and all that, we got to learn a lot about that like beforehand, and you know it has helped us along the way know things like like we want to make our shows events so we don't want to get a weekly gig like those were things that like we sort of talked about at school um and a, a lot of those things helped us but as far as the o i did take a class with gregory davis about touring as, and that was the most real class <laughs> on touring He's the guy from uh, from Dirty Dozen. Yeah, founding member of Dirty Dozen. Uh, Dave, do, do you feel like you benefit from the fact that Andrew went to college for this kind of stuff? Does does that help? Does that pay off for the band? I think absolutely. In the early stages, you know, we it, it definitely did for sure. I mean, we now we kind of have people who really just hopefully we're relying on to know all this stuff, you <laughs> yeah. know. But yeah, certainly in, in in the beginning, we we didn't know anything. I mean, I. I literally almost, I almost signed away all of my mechanical royalties in my first year. <laughs> like, I, I just didn't, you know, it was just kind of, I was like, oh, yeah, you're going to help me out? Sure. You know, I didn't know. No, I, I was like, Dave, hey, do don't not do sign that. that. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And when I kind of got here, it was the beauty of having a seven-piece band. Everybody had a role already once I got here. You know, Dave backed up the trailer. Mike did the tech stuff. You had... <laughs> Dave also did the construction stuff and building lighting rigs and things from yeah. the beginning. So there's always, everybody's had a job. You've had Ed, who was an accountant, who did all of the accounting for the band in the beginning. George yep. considered himself to be the touring god, so wanted to be the tour manager in the beginning. Yep. So you, everybody had a responsibility based on yep. their backgrounds that just happened to fall into. So it, it's not like they, That's they didn't bring any big. skill set into it. They all had the natural skills to just fill in a role and when you have seven people, there's a lot of jobs to go around, and so you get a lot further because you get a lot also of a lot of mouths to feed. True, that's yeah. also a good yeah. point. <laughs> but no, I was just I was just gonna kind of just speak to that. It's that was definitely a, a you know we're talking about how you kind of get from here to there. When you guys were first starting out, do you feel as though you had a realistic appreciation for just how much work this was going to be, exactly how difficult this was going to be. And by work and difficulty, I'm thinking like 11 hour van rides and things like that. Yeah, but it's, it, it was a, that's what we wanted to do. Yeah. It was a joy, you know, it was a joy for me to go into the post office and send out T-shirts and CDs, and, and and spend two hours of a day Zach was doing our merch, that. You know, merchandising guy. It, 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 it was a joy to, to to drive to Pensacola and sleep on our friend's floor and couch in this beautiful you know house overlooking the water. I remember the, one time Andrew's girlfriend at the time we we're about to drive back from from Pensacola and she was with us for the weekend and she said, "How do you how do you do this? Like how do you do this all the time?" 
and I, I was sitting there and I had and I and I said, "What are you talking about? I'm a eat, I'm about to eat a choco taco." <laughs> <laughs> Living the dream, man. Like this is great. What That's, do you mean? <laughs> yeah. The, the our definition of the kind of work it's it's interesting because yeah. we would get back from being on tour and then we practice every day 11 to 4. That's we we just decided that was what we were going to do. So it it was a lot of work and the the van, you know, we get paid to drive around the country and set up some band's gear, but then we get to play it and no, that's not the part we get paid for. Yeah, <laughs> it's, and, it's and the, the that's the fun part. We didn't the alternative when you're in your 20s is like I don't know, going getting some job you don't care about. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> pretty much, uh, or maybe you do care about it. Yeah, yeah, maybe you do, but is, with with this, it, just from being here as a passenger in this whole ride, is be careful what you wish for. Because if you <laughs> really want to do this, there's a lot of work associated with it. You have to show up every day. I mean, I go I go to bed probably at 3 a.m. every night on tour, and I wake up at 8 a.m. and I'm the first one into the room. I'm the last one to leave. But it's it's not something I would have expected when I'm. 22, I probably said, man, it'd be really great to go around the country and watch my friends play music and be happy for the rest of it. But you don't get the pieces of the puzzle that go for it. But you have to be ready for it. So you always have to be willing to amend and just kind of work as a team and a unit. And that's what I think a lot of people miss along the way. It's the work gets really hard and they just let it overwhelm them and it just, oh, I don't want to do this. I don't want to go to the post office and send merch. I'd rather at home and eat five Chaco Tacos. <laughs> so, I mean, it's this perspective of you've got to continue. The work's only gotten harder the more, we've, the more success we've gotten. We, we might sit a little bit comfortably now that we're not you know, in, a bu in a van every day with you know, 11 of us. It's a sense of, you know, we get to ride in a bus, but it's, you know, still, it's not like it's a, it's a, a life that you walk into and be like, this is going to be great, yeah. great. This little coffin is mine every day, my privacy. Curtain. You end up, you end up learning. It, it is a job, you know, like anything else. And you have, you have colleagues, you have coworkers, and there's, there's, there's conflicts and there's stresses and there's a lot of time with people and there's a lot of time that you're uncomfortable, you're tired or you're grumpy. So there's th there's an element where it's you know anything anything a dream becomes true and then it's not it's never exactly as you thought it's going to be it's never there's like I'm happy now for the rest of my life because I did this you know that's just not what makes people happy that's not how humans operate like there's, yeah there's <laughs> a level of also like you know we're, we had uh, we opened for the Radiators on one of their last shows <laughs> and they said. We were asking them, how do you stay Save together for guys. 30 years? And they said, separate hotel rooms. And that, <laughs> that's very true. I mean, you, you don't, if, if you get so sick of each other, which it's going to happen when you're, I mean, it's like a family. Like, you love your family, you, but you get sick of them sometimes. You and be alone it's going to happen. So it's like, it's okay. Navigating that is important. But like, you know, that, that, the personal point of being on the road together and and at, you know being making it a good environment to be in helps you exist and there's a lot of value in existing because then when you have more when you have more and more shows you get better at them and when you write more and more songs you get better at it so like just making it through to stay together for 10 years you, unless you're not doing anything you're going to be way better than you were when you started Understanding that there's a huge amount of work that goes into it, is, is it fair to say also that there is every now and again that little bit of unbelievable good luck that will sometimes come your way? If, if I'm not mistaken, I, re I remember a story about you guys getting a song into the HBO series Treme, if not completely, but at least partially because was it Andrew, George, George yeah. whose roommate was yeah. uh, David Simon, the producer of the show's assistant. So that, that, yeah. you, that there's an element of luck, but it's, it was also us pressing for years this connection. <laughs> and I like sent David Simon a personal letter like uh, as well. And, you know, we were trying for years to, to, to make this happen. And, you know, it actually is and not that big of a thing. And if they had put you on earlier, that, that show like, would have been so much more successful. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but it, it, that is that is the good that yeah. is a good point is that you you sort of make your own luck. Like sometimes you do get luck into situations, but like that's because people, you know, somebody random knows you because you've been doing all these other things or something and then you feel like, "Oh, yeah. what luck we got 
you know, this random person hit us up that doesn't know us and is helping us but out or something. But if there hadn't been that initial connection, but so that yes. wouldn't have had it, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the, that is the luck part, for sure. But as you said, pushing that connection. You still like, gotta, on, you man, still, you you to still gotta, show, yeah, man. you still gotta yeah. press those buttons a little bit. You gotta try. Without being obnoxious. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions for these guys? This is a great opportunity to talk to some guys that are out there doing it. Please come up and use the mic. Um, while we're waiting, don't be for, shy. Don't be shy. While while we're waiting, um, you know, kind of cliche question. Um, well, I'm going to let her ask a question and, and then pull, pull that mic down. But but I, I do have one more question that I want to ask you before we run out of time. Sure, we sure. only have a couple more minutes. Uh, looking back on your, because you've been together for so long now and you know the ins and outs of everything, what advice would you give to yourselves individually, as being members of the band, like three years in? So, so three years in, we're talking uh, 2010. So this is like the year after several of us graduated. We're just I'd starting say, Dave, the tour. don't be drinking all those Red Bulls. <laughs> <laughs> you got something? Um, it's hard. I mean, yeah. yeah. Well, is there anything you think you would have chosen to do differently, or were you kind of just going with the flow the whole time? I mean, I think I definitely would have. I would have. I wish that I had realized kind of a little earlier that you know when you it's it's important that when you get back from weeks on the road to take the time to rest but it's also like when we started practicing together every day that's when we really got tight and as as we've you know as things have ebbed and flowed with how much we tour sometimes we'll get back and say have a week off but so we don't rehearse if if just staying, just musically, from just a musical standpoint, just like staying invested in the craft while you're playing the same songs every night mm -hmm. is really important because it allows you to infuse kind of new yeah. energy into those same songs, those performances. I was um, kind of thinking the same thing. Like I, I, I wouldn't change that much because I'm ultimately happy where we are today, but I, I, I would, I guess I would say, like, knowing that what I know now, like, look, be sec feel secure where you are and and value, uh, just put more time in on, on your craft because I, I, I do think that could have been something I could have focused more on. I, I still want to focus more on that. I think there's plenty of room for growth. So I'm, I'm investing a lot of my time doing that now, and I think I could have done more back then, and it would have it been good. Practice. Yeah. We are almost out of time, but uh, there is one thing that I wanted to ask you. So at the time that you guys started the band, 2007, there were a lot of digital technology things that are very commonplace today, but that really weren't even there at the time that you started. Uh, iTunes was barely on the market. Spotify just There had, wasn't GPS. There wasn't GPS. <laughs> <laughs> like, we had to tour without, with MapQuest directions that we printed out at first. OK, fair For enough. Real. But <laughs> also things like but Spotify, um, you know, Facebook was barely existing. There was no Instagram. Uh, back in those days, so I'd, I wonder, you know, if you were starting again today, are there things that you would be able to do differently because of digital technology that you would, weren't able to do in the beginning? No, we used all the, the digital technology that was available. We we're used MySpace, we used Facebook. It was, it was just for college kids at that point, but we, we, we had it because of that, and um, we, we, we went hard on it. Um, one of our biggest, yeah. one of our most actually significant kind of things was this, like, Facebook um, fan voting that how we got to play Hangout in 2013 was just one of our first big festivals. It was the first time that we were really felt like a wave of support from this online community of people that like had organized themselves and like we, we got this giant push from like the New Orleans community and this pe community yeah. in Pensacola and just like it was all of a sudden from that point before we've sort of felt this Facebook presence and now it's turned it's organized itself into like our our uh, Facebook group called the Rev Heads. Now we have a fan amazing an amazing fan fan group and they oh my god that's it's like that's a bit of that is been, I would say that well, I yeah, think we that do a whole panel spot on this, of luck. this group yeah. of friends fans we, that have pushed this band. We didn't start that. They started it themselves. That's like, you know, that is one thing that I would say is we didn't plan, and we got we got lucky that they found themselves and coagulated into a group. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to <laughs> the Redheads. <laughs> I'm afraid that we are um, basically out of time for this panel, but I just want to thank you personally and on behalf of all of us and everybody watching on, on the interwebs for you guys for being here. It's David our pleasure, Shaw. man. I'm eating a Chaco Taco. Are you kidding? It's a joy. <laughs> Zach Feinberg, thank you. Andrew Campanelli, and thank you. the ever loyal tour manager, David Mellorine. The revivalists, everybody. Thank you, Scott. Thank you.